Hi, my name is Inbar Freed, and today I'll be presenting our paper titled Design Considerations for a Steerable Needle Robot to Maximize Reachable Long Volume. This work was done by our lab at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, jointly with our collaborators at Vanderbilt University and the University of Utah. Cancer continues to be the second leading cause of death in the United States annually, with lung and bronchus cancers being the primary causes of cancer-related death in both men and women, accounting for nearly a quarter of annual cancer deaths. The mortality rate is so high for lung cancer, largely because most cases only get diagnosed at a late stage. And part of the reason for this is that lesions can appear anywhere in the lung, with peripheral regions or those close to the edge of the lung space being notoriously difficult to access. In order to increase access to these difficult to reach lung regions, it's important to understand the limitations and capabilities of existing diagnostic techniques and of novel systems. To do so, we use two metrics to evaluate diagnostic capabilities that are clinically motivated by experiments and conversations with our physician collaborators. The first is reachability, where a technique with high reachability means that we can access a high proportion of the lung. For example, blue regions in the figure on the right are reachable for a given design. And the second is high reachable redundancy. Inspired by prior work from Berner Cars et al., the reachable redundancy score is a per region value that measures the number of unique ways to redundantly reach a lung region for a specific device in finite time. This is an important score for our application since accurate bronchoscope navigation to a biopsy site is an inherently challenging task. And this score helps us identify regions of the lung that are robust to this uncertainty in device deployment. As an example, in the figure on the right, the regions close to the midline and towards the bottom are most robust to uncertainty in device deployment. In light of these criteria, let's first consider existing diagnostic techniques. In order to definitively diagnose a suspicious lesion as lung cancer, a tissue sample must be acquired. Other than surgery, there are two primary techniques for diagnosing suspicious lesions. The first is transthoracic biopsy where a physician inserts a biopsy needle through the chest wall into the lungs, generally under image guidance. This technique has a very high diagnostic yield and is able to reach nearly all regions in the lung, but has a relatively high risk for pneumothorax, which is a medical complication where air enters the space between the chest wall and the lungs. The second technique, transoral biopsy, involves a physician navigating a bronchoscope through the mouth and into the airway towards a target lesion. It has a really good safety profile with less than 1% of cases developing a pneumothorax, but has a relatively poor diagnostic yield at just 50 to 60%. In addition, the number of patients that can benefit from this safe approach is limited because the technique is only able to access nodules that are close to an airway. Up until now, we've been assuming that our workspace looks like this. But in reality, the lung environment is full of obstacles, including blood vessels, shown in red, and lung fissures, which separate lung lobes and humans, shown in yellow, and we need to avoid all this anatomy for the patient's safety. So then, if we consider the metric of reachability, how do existing techniques perform? We know that with, with existing transoral approaches, physicians are only able to extend the biopsy needle 10 to 15 millimeters beyond the airway wall. So the reachable space would look something like this, shown here in blue. This represents roughly only 10% of lung tissue. Given the challenges and limitations of existing techniques, our group, along with our collaborators, have been working on a new diagnostic technique that aims to combine the accessibility of the transthoracic approach with the safety of the transoral approach. Here's an artistic depiction of the system, which is comprised of a bronchoscopically deployed, robotically actuated, steerable needle, including a conventional bronchoscope, a piercing stylet to exit the airways into the lung tissue, and a steerable needle. The procedure can be broken down into three stages that correspond to the three system components I showed on the previous slide. There's manual deployment of the bronchoscope, manual deployment of the piercing stylet, and then automatic deployment of the steerable needle. Here's a close-up photograph of the device. We have the bronchoscope, the piercing stylet, and the steerable needle. And here's a video of the steerable needle getting pushed through gelatin. This is meant to show the sorts of curvilinear trajectories that the needle can follow. And here's a photograph showing the full system. We have the robot shown on the right, which passes the piercing stylet and steerable needle through the working channel of the bronchoscope from the head of the bronchoscope to its tip. As I pointed out earlier, existing transoral approaches are only able to reach roughly 10% of lung tissue. So our goal in this work was to better understand the design choices for our device with respect to the two criteria of reachability and reachable redundancy that we defined earlier. And in doing so, we aim to assess the clinical utility of our system, identify important design choices, 
and identify future areas for innovation. To perform this evaluation, we selected three major system parameters. These include the bronchoscope radius, which determines the depth of the bronchoscope can reach in the airway, the maximum piercing angle with which we can exit the airway into the lung tissue, and the steerable needle's minimum radius of curvature, which is a measure of how curvy of a trajectory the needle can follow, with lower values corresponding to higher levels of curvature. We then define a given design as a triple of these three values. And the values that we chose here are meant to really capture a wide spectrum of system capabilities. At this point, you might wonder, why not just use the thinnest bronchoscope with the maximum puncture angle and the curviest needle? And a lot of effort has been put into doing just that. However, the challenge is that for each design choice, there generally exists a trade-off. For example, thinner bronchoscopes have a smaller working channel, which can limit the diagnostic devices we can pass through them. Similarly, achieving higher exit angles means requiring additional hardware, and higher levels of curvature can often cause shearing in tissue during deployment. So it's important to understand the domain-specific challenges and clinical implications of each design choice in order to determine which parameters are most important to optimize in future innovation efforts. To model device deployment and measure our criteria for a given design, we randomly sampled points in the airway that obey the constraints from a specified bronchoscope radius and from a specified maximum piercing exit angle. In the figure, each of these poses is shown as a sphere, but in reality, each sphere also has a corresponding orientation for the exit angle in 3D. Each of these points serves as a starting pose for the needle. And now that we have these starting poses, we want to determine all the places we can reach. To do so, we use motion planning, which allows us to explore the reachable space in an efficient way while obeying the system's constraints and avoiding obstacles. Specifically, we use the Rapidly Exploring Random Tree, or RRT algorithm, to efficiently explore our reachable space. Since we don't actually have a goal and are really interested in all reachable areas from a given star pose, we grow the RRT in all directions under the kinematic constraints of the needle. In order to obey the non-holonomic and curvature constraints of the needle, we use a customized RRT where the tree growth looks like this. Given the nature of the RRT algorithm, we're guaranteed to never over-approximate the reachable workspace of the system. Additionally, the RRT favors growth towards large unvisited regions and expansion asymptotically approaches the true reachable workspace as more time passes. Now that we have these three design components and a way to model them, we can efficiently and reliably evaluate any given system design under the two criteria of reachability and reachable redundancy that we previously defined. To perform our analysis, we used five human chest CT scans from the Lung Image Database Consortium and Image Database Resource Initiative, a publicly available data set hosted on the Cancer Imaging Archive. Let's start by considering reachability. Before jumping to the results, I'll build up our figure step by step. What we'll measure on the y-axis is the estimated percentage of the lung that is reachable for a given design, where a design defined on the x-axis is a triple of the three parameters we've been discussing. For a given design, we'll measure this reachable score as an average across the five patient's lungs. We'll compare radius of curvature, maximum piercing exit angle, and bronchoscope radius. For example, for the design consisting of a 100 millimeter radius of curvature needle, 30 degrees maximum exit angle, and 1.5 millimeter radius bronchoscope, we're able to reach approximately 50% of the lung on average. We then extend the axes to include all design parameters for the radius of curvature, for the maximum piercing exit angle, and for the bronchoscope radius. And ultimately, we end up with this figure. Immediately, the obvious trend we see is the one we expected, namely that maximizing the capabilities of each individual parameter results in the most capable system. But as we mentioned earlier, there are constraints and trade-offs we need to consider making such devices not yet feasible. On the other hand, we can start to see other trends as well. If we consider this design that has an ultra-thin bronchoscope, we can see that we can improve reachability by exchanging that ultra-thin bronchoscope for thicker bronchoscopes, pointed to by the orange arrows, if we're able to, re to increase the exit angle capabilities. Similarly, we can see that if our needle is limited to a higher minimum radius of curvature, pointed to with the orange arrow, we're still able to achieve equivalent or higher reachability over several designs with curvier needles, shown under the blue bracket, if we optimize our exit angle capabilities and use a thinner bronchoscope. We can also consider our current system, 
and we can see that finding a way to improve the needle's radius of curvature safely, pointing to in pink, is much more worthwhile than increasing the exit angle capabilities or moving to a thinner bronchoscope, both shown in orange. With these same results, we can also visualize the specific regions in the lung anatomy that we're able to reach. We see that even with our most constrained device, we're able to reach 21% of the lung tissue, which is 11% more of the space compared to the 10% value we saw for the existing transoral approach. And with the most capable design, only 15% of the lung remains unreachable. We can visualize specifically the regions of the lung that remain unreachable, which in this case happens to be the top areas of the lung. Although this device is not yet feasible in hardware, being able to visualize these regions is important because it informs us which areas are generally hard to reach. You can imagine that this sort of visual visualization might also help in procedures to know if a device can reach a specific lesion in a patient. We can then evaluate both of these designs using the reachable redundancy metric. And when we do so, we see that the most capable design shown in the bottom has a higher average reachable redundancy score per voxel in the image space. However, the most constrained device shown on top has a higher maximum redundancy count of 27, in large part because it inherently explores less of the workspace and therefore repeatedly reaches the same confined regions. We also see that the regions of the lung that are in the lower region and posterior generally have the highest reachable redundancy for both cases, and that regions near the top of the lung are challenging to redundantly reach, as we expected based on the reachability results. In conclusion, through this work, we show that bronchoscopically deployed steerable needle robots can improve early lung cancer diagnosis via increased reach over existing transoral approaches. We showed that by using motion planning, we can efficiently and accurately evaluate design choices for our system. We show that these design choices ultimately have a significant impact on the capabilities of the system, and that we need to strongly consider trade-offs between the system properties and domain-specific challenges. And we show that reachable, redundant, uh, reachable workspace analysis can help us evaluate the clinical utility of the system and furthermore inform future innovation efforts. I'd like to end by thanking all of my co-authors and collaborators that have made this work possible. And thank you for listening. <laughs>